Welcome to episode 161 of 10 Minute Record Reviews. This time I'm going to talk about Gang of Four's debut album from 1979 on EMI Entertainment. And what I have here is a 2014 reissue on Parlophone, which sounds amazing and dead quiet vinyl. It's almost impossible to find original copies of the early releases for less than a few hundred bucks. So this is a good alternative. So this is post-punk which is a pretty broad category. And I take that to mean bands which emerged after punk's first era had kind of flamed out, who'd been inspired by the punks, but who differed from them in a number of key ways. First of all, they rejected the anti-music aesthetic of punk. They actually wanted to play their instruments and play them well. Secondly, when it came time to deliver the message, they preferred irony to shock. And third, they were more self-consciously arty and cerebral than the punks had been. In short, post-punk bands had the same kind of visceral disagreement with society that the punks had, but they wanted to make their arguments stick and they wanted to be in the conversation for longer and not just flame out. Gang of Four were a part of this along with Talking Heads, Joy Division, Public Image, Killing Joke, the goth bands, the Violent Femmes. You could even make, I think, an argument for the Smiths depending how long you want to extend the definition. When I was a kid coming out of high school in the early 1980s, this stuff filled up half of my brain. The other half was filled up with Zeppelin, The Who, The Beatles, The Stones, Deep Purple, and Sabbath. Gang of Four, of course, are comprised of vocalist John King, guitarist Andy Gill, drummer Hugo Burnham, and bassist Dave Allen. In the mid-1970s, these guys were all art students at Leeds University. They were part of a whole kind of scene there, or a bunch of other bands that came out of there, including the Mekons. Although heavily influenced by the punks, these guys were also fans of other bands that were not considered to be cool by the punks, people like Free, basically long hairs, blues rockers, and so on. So they had eclectic musical influences. They were also heavily influenced by political thought. And although you can listen to the music just for the music's sake, I think their political ideas are central to the message they were kind of get across. And there were really two strains of thought, Marxism and Situationism, that informed the band. The Marxist piece in their lyrics is very much based on what Marx called commodity fetishism, which is essentially a critique of consumer society and this whole idea that products have some sort of innate cash value or innate value as opposed to having the value of the labor that actual human beings, workers, put into them. Situationism is a little bit more obscure. It was more common in leftist circles in the 60s and 70s. And it's kind of an offshoot of Marxism, which basically takes issue with mainstream Marxists who said, listen, you know, culture is an escape from the degradation of living in a capitalist society. The situation has said, no, capitalism has basically eaten culture along with everything else. And so to consume most culture these days is basically consuming what the state and the capitalist ruling class is feeding us. We have to question and rip apart and tear down everything. Their name, of course, comes from the name applied to that faction of the Chinese Communist Party, closely associated with Mao in his declining years, who were largely blamed by the subsequent regime as having been responsible for some of the worst excesses of the Cultural Revolution. Their first single, Damaged Goods, which also occurs in this record, was released in December 1978. and was picked up by John Peel, the influential BBC DJ. On the strength of that, they got a pretty big underground following. They did brief but very successful tours of Europe and North America in 78-79, and they're signed to EMI Records. Their debut for EMI at Home is a Tourist charts in 1979, and they get invited to go on top of the pops. That's where things go a bit sideways. In the lyrics is a reference to rubbers being tucked into someone's pocket. The producers asked them to change that to rubbish. The band said the hell with that and walked off the set and did not appear on top of the pops. While that was admirable in terms of standing up for their artistic credibility, it did mean that their label got pissed off of them because that, of course, was the ticket to massive sales by being on top of the pops. So EMI takes their attention, which they had been playing to Gang of Four, and looks around the rest of their stable and decides to promote another band by the name of Duran Duran, who then go on to great things. And Gang of Four never really get commercial traction after that particular point, as good as their music would turn out to be. So at this point, unsure of their relationship with their label, Gang of Four goes into the Workhouse Studio in 1979 to record this record. The album was produced by John King, the vocalist, and Andy Gill, the guitarist, along with Rob War, their manager at the time. In terms of technique, in terms of style, it's a fascinating record, and it's one brimming with talent. There's lots of amazing riffing, some incredible groove, incredible drumming. It's also very much, obviously, the product of its makers, who were four art students who were quite politically obsessed and who hadn't, however, 
done much living of life outside of essentially the world of middle class white art student. Most of these guys were actually reasonably well off in their personal lives, with the exception of the bass player who was actually the only genuine proletarian of this quite Marxist band. Given that the politics of the record are pretty much in your face from the first time you put it on, I think you kind of have to engage with that. And to me, it sounds like they're singing about a life which has been intellectually examined, but not emotionally lived at that stage. The lyrics in the band's own description are heavily thought out, and they are, again, based on Marxism and situationism. And so what you get is this content which is relentlessly anti-consumerist and anti-establishment. At the same time, musically, it's fascinating because they're plowing this furrow between rock and funk, which leads us eventually to the Red Hot Chili Peppers. It leads us to Rage Against the Machine. It's very much in that kind of a lane. At the time, it was completely novel. The album starts with Ether, and right away you've got the blueprint for the band right in your face. You've got punchy, funky bass. It's forward in the mix. You've got a very immediate production style. You've got a highly political lyric. You've got almost anti-singing. King's range was not the greatest. Thematically, this is concerned with the torture, which was inflicted on Irish Republican prisoners in the H Block prison in Northern Ireland by the British, and the term white noise is actually a reference to the use of basically stress and distress uh, techniques which the British were employing against their prisoners at the time. Musically, somewhat surprisingly, this is not actually, I don't think, the strongest song in this record, and I'm sort of surprised they let off with it. It's just okay. Next song, however, Natural's Not In It, is excellent, and this really is Gang of Four at their best. Andy Gill's work on guitar is fantastic, amazing riffing, and just the, the energy and tension that comes from his playing, and almost the nervous energy which plays itself out in his different lines is just remarkable. Not Great Men is the next track. This is another great high energy, punchy track, thematically rejecting the idea that it's charismatic individuals that make history. This idea would, of course, minimize the actions of ordinary people and the working class. Band basically making the point that historical change derives from a mandate for the masses, not from some farcical or poetic ceremony. Damaged Goods was their debut single, one of the great breakup songs in the post punk catalog. Kind of like punk beats Nile Rogers, sort of edgy, chicken scratch, funky kind of guitar. Anyway, brilliant work by Andy Gill, brilliant work by the whole band. Return the Gift has a rhythm section coming to the fore with Dave Allen's bass really driving the song along. I'm not really sure what the song is about, but I do always like the line, go to Scotland, no obligation. Final track on side one, which concludes a very strong album side, is Guns Before Butter, which has this uh, kind of a martial sort of a beat, unsurprisingly. Lyrics, of course, are critical of militarism. Uh, just another strong song. Side 2 starts is one of my favorites of theirs, which is I found that essence rare. As an intro, you have a very spare riff, and then you're into the punk funk. Glass is next. A little bit confusing as to what this is about. It seems to be about restlessness and the tendency of people to use drugs, everyday drugs, to kind of take the edge off. Contract is about the awkwardness of sex and about expectation and obligation, I guess, in relationships. You know, asking basically is intimacy just kind of contractual? It seems like the kind of a question I think that people without a lot of experience of intimacy or life experience tend to ask. That's followed by At Home He's a Tourist, which is a terrific song, the song which they should have played on top of the pops, but for the rubber's point of principle. 545, the second last track, introduces a little bit of variety in that you've got a melodica, which is a sort of a simple woodwind instrument which John King is playing. The lyrics are a little bit cryptic, but it seems to be about Marxist terrorist organizations in Europe in the 1970s, people like the Red Brigades, who the band are basically critiquing, saying, you know, all the political violence you're engaging in, the kidnapping and the murders and so on is great theater, but you're not really advancing the cause of the working class. All you're doing is providing fodder for the capitalist media industry. The album concludes with another highlight, Anthrax, which begins with a whole bunch of feedback the lyrical concept here is that love is a bit like a case of anthrax, which was slightly controversial radio-wise. Musically, this is a groundbreaking and influential record, and I don't think you get Red Hot Chili Peppers or Rage Against the Machine without Gang of Four. Politically, it's also quite influential on a lot of bands at the time. But lyrically, as I mentioned, it's kind of emotionally cold and stunted. It's a bit like the vinyl equivalent of being in an all-male undergraduate philosophy seminar. But despite all that, despite the thought out nature of this record, the music itself, the quality of it, and the energy of the music overwhelms and is the fundamental experience of listening to this. It's visceral, it's alive, it's exciting. And as songs go, I'd have to say that eight of the 12 songs here are pretty damn good and there are no real weak tracks. It's a brilliant piece of post-punk. Politically, it's a fascinating album, even if emotionally it's a little bit stunted. And I think it's essential to understanding that particular time in music. And for me, it's four and a half out of five stars.